Well, hey everyone, I want to welcome you to worship. I'm so glad to be back with my church family. I had a wonderful study break. It was a time of planning and preparation. It was also an opportunity for us to take some vacation. We were able to travel to the mountains of Wyoming and to hike in the Grand Tetons. There's just something about the mountains that I love that remind me of the presence of God and His goodness in my life. So I'm glad to be back. I'm here in the youth room in our youth building to present the message today. But as we think about worship, I want to ask you to consider something. Think about something in your life that was really important to you that you had to fight for, that you had to defend, you had to protect, that you had to hold tightly in order not to lose it. Now, there are likely many things in our lives that we've had to fight for in order to attain, achieve, and to keep but we often don't think about our faith in this way. Well, we're gonna look at a passage of scripture today that the Apostle Paul writes in his letter to Timothy, the second letter to Timothy, chapter four, verses seven and eight, where he describes the battle for faith. And that's what I wanna to speak to you about today, fighting for our faith. And I hope it's gonna be an encouragement to you. So I hope that you're ready. Get your Bible, open your church app, look at the notes and be ready to praise and worship. It's going to be a great time together at the Brook Church. So let's bow in prayer and let's give this time to our Father in Heaven. Father, we thank you. We are so grateful and so excited for all that you're doing, even in the midst of this difficult season that we're walking through. I pray for our church family. I pray for those who are outside of our church family, who are listening and watching today. I pray that we would worship you in spirit and truth. I pray that we would give ourselves fully to you. And I pray, God, that in each and every way, you would bless this time and speak to us, to your glory. Bring us close to you. We trust you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey there, Brook Church family. It's so good to see you today. I love to invite you just to take part in what we're doing here today. We're going to seek the face of God in His presence right where we're at. Let's sing together. God is able. God is able, He will never fail, He is almighty God, greater than all we see, greater than all we ask, He has done great things, lift it up, lift it up, He defeated the grave. To life, our God is able, and in His name we overcome. That's it for the
faithful, yes, he is in his name. We overcome, yes, we do. Come on. Before the Lord, my God is able, lifted up. tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know well, I won't be shaken Oh, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love and my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love and my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love oh. and shame no longer has a place to hide and I I'm not a captive to the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind Oh, I won't be shaken Oh, I won't be shaken No, cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I Yeah. 
never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God Cause all my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am made Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire darkest nights You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God yeah. all my life you have been faithful
walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You've never failed me yet Oh come to pass My heart will sing your praise again Yes it will Miss oh. Jesus you're still in love Keep me Keep me within your love oh. My heart will sing Once 
Welcome to The Brook Church Online. My name is Chandler. I'm our student pastor here at The Brook Church Community. We're so glad that you're here and thankful that you chose to join us for online services today. And so with that being said, if you're a guest with us today, and maybe this is your first time tuning in here at The Brook, we just wanna say on behalf of our staff and everybody here at the church, man, welcome to The Brook Church family. We are so glad that you are here with us today. And so if you wouldn't mind letting us know that you're here by filling out an online connection form, you can do that in one or two different ways. You can do that, number one, through our Brook Church app by clicking on the Start Here tile, that will take you to the form. Or already on whether you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube, there should be a link that will shoot you uh, directly to that form as well. And so again, welcome to the family. I'm glad that you are here today. So I wanted to tell you about a phrase that we've been saying in student ministry really since I got here. We've been saying this in person, and we were saying this in person a lot, is the phrase becoming more like Jesus together. And so it's the idea that, hey, we don't want to become more like Jesus in isolation or separated from each other, but really in the confines of community. We want to become more like Jesus together. Obviously, that has been a little bit more difficult as of late, but we have made the commitment, and I want to challenge you as well, to continue becoming more like Jesus together online. And I know that that is difficult at times, but man, I just want to encourage you today, whether that's liking the post, sharing the post uh, on your Facebook or your social media streams and platforms, uh, inviting somebody to watch alongside you, or maybe it's saying hi to somebody that you haven't seen in a while in the comments, or maybe it's just telling us, hey, like, hey, I'm watching from uh, my living room couch right now. Whatever that looks like, we just want to continue to be a church that becomes more like Jesus together. And so I know it looks a little bit different right now, but we really believe that it is possible uh, for us to continue to connect online. And so today I am officially declaring today to be the hand waving emoji day. And so if you're watching our services online at some point, if you're able to throughout the service, I want you to uh, drop a couple of wave emojis. Let us know where you're watching services from today. And as we continue to become more like Jesus together here at the Brook. And so um, with that being said, Pastor Mike is back. He's teaching uh, the lesson today. And so we're excited to, that he is back with us. But before we get uh, to the lesson today, I wanna remind you that on August 6th and August 9th will be the first uh, weekend of our new series, This Is Us, where Pastor Mike is gonna take us uh, through the vision of the Brook and talk to us about how uh, people like us do things like this. And so I'm so excited to be a part of that series for the first time and so excited to hear from Pastor Mike. And I'm excited to hear what Pastor Mike has to say today uh, for our lesson. And so let me pray and then we will turn it over to Pastor Mike. Heavenly Father, God, we just come before you. God, we are grateful um, for what you are doing here at the Brook Church and what you are doing uh, through your people. And God, how you are continuing to call us to serve this community. And so God, would you strengthen our people? God, would you bless this time in the word that you're about to speak through Pastor Mike? God, would you challenge us and refresh us today? And it is in your name that we pray. And everybody watching service today said, amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Chandler. So on our flight on the way to Wyoming, I watched a very interesting documentary that I want to share with you and read to you. It's a true story about a British expedition that was in the early 20th century that was led by a man named Ernest Shackleton. This story is the greatest story of endurance and survival that I have personally ever heard. So here's what happened. In 1914, he and a crew of 27 others set out from England on a ship to sail to Antarctica and then cross the continent through the South Pole. They sailed all the way to about 100 miles from the continent, but before reaching land, their ship got stuck and stranded in ice that had formed on the Weddell Sea. This began their amazing adventure. Having no other options, they stayed there with their stranded ship for nine months on drifting ice, hoping that it would break free. Eventually, it was crushed by the ice and sank. The 28 men of the expedition were now isolated on ice hundreds of miles from land with no ship, no means of communication with the outside world, and with limited supplies. After another month, Shackleton ordered that they break camp and march toward nearest land. So they moved west, pulling three large lifeboats across the ice, and they did this for two weeks. 
Exhausted in realizing that traveling like this was futile, they stopped. For four months, they waited for the ice to break away into water. Facing starvation, they had to shoot and eat their sled dogs. It was now 14 months since the ship had become frozen in the ice and nearly five months since it had sunk. Finally, the drifting ice came to open water and they could see an island known as Elephant Island. So they loaded the lifeboats and sailed for six full days in these boats to arrive at it. Yet, once they got there, their story wasn't over. There was nothing there on this small, craggy island but penguins. As the only way for rescue, Shackleton and five others decided that they would board one of the lifeboats and attempt to sail 750 miles to another large island from which they departed toward the beginning of their journey. Its name was South Georgia Island. Civilization was there and getting to it was their only hope. So the plan was to get there and then to come back for the remaining 23 men. So they set out to open sea and on icy cold waters, they sailed for 14 days, packed down in the hull of this boat and they finally arrived at South Georgia Island. But still their story is not over. They arrived on the south side of the island. Human settlements were on the north side of the island. In one final burst of effort, Shackleton and two others made a nonstop 36-hour crossing of the island's mountains. They at last reached a whaling station. But due to ice, it would take another three months for them to return to Elephant Island. But finally, on August 30, 1916, the 23 men stranded on Elephant Island saw the rescue boat and were saved by Shackleton. Not a single man died on this expedition, all of them were rescued. That's amazing, isn't it? Do you know what the name of their ship was? The Endurance. How fitting, right? Now, I watched this documentary sitting comfortably on an airplane, traveling to Wyoming for vacation, 30,000 feet up in the air while sipping a cup of coffee. <laughs> it felt blasphemous to me. And the reason I tell you this story is because I want to draw a contrast between our notions about achievement and how it takes place and what is reality when it comes to acquiring that which is important in life. Because we live in a world that expects things to be easy and we get upset when they're not. I'm guilty of this. I don't like to wait. I don't like to endure. I don't like to struggle for things that I desire. But why do we have that expectation? Because life teaches us that the opposite is true. That to gain things of immense value, we must fight and struggle for them. That is almost always the case. It's true as well for our faith. The imagery of battle and struggle for matters of faith is found all throughout the New Testament. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul talks about the armor of God for spiritual warfare. In Jude 3, it says we are to contend for our faith. In Matthew chapter 16, those famous words of Jesus are recorded where Jesus is talking about the church and the battle for souls that the church is to engage in. And he says that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. In Philippians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says that followers of Christ are not only called to believe in Jesus, but also to suffer for His name. So faith, authentic faith, life-altering faith is not just dropped in our laps. We are to fight for it. God expects that, by the way. That's not by accident. It's part of His design of faith, I believe, because in the battle for faith, amazing things happen in us and through us in the course of of that fight. Now, if you don't know this already, it's likely that you're learning this right now because we're in a season in history, in life, where we're we are fighting a battle unlike any other that we've ever seen before. It's a different kind of battle. And I want to share with you as we, we begin today, I want to share with you some traits and maybe some temptations that accompany the battle in which we are fighting before us, the battle for our faith. And so, first of all, there's a temptation toward apathy. Folks, it's easy just to drift right now, isn't it? I talked to a man recently, a church member, who told me that he and his wife had gotten up for two Sunday mornings in a row and just got busy doing things and really kind of forgot about watching worship 
and attending worship online. And the second Sunday that afternoon, they came to this realization and they talked to one another and they basically said to one another, hey, this is not acceptable for us to just miss worship. It's not acceptable for us to neglect God in this way. So they were able to correct that. But it's an illustration of how easy it is right now for us to grow apathetic unless we fight against it. The second temptation that we face is a temptation toward isolation. Isolation. One of my fears for our church is that people are growing isolated from one, from one another. Why is that a fear of mine? Because I know that with isolation grows darkness and sin. You separate yourself from others, you disconnect from other believers, it begins a downward spiral. And a darkness begins to set in over our lives, a darkness that leads to temptation where we are exposed to things that are hurtful and harmful to us, which leads then to sinful behavior that hurt us and hurt others. So it's easy to isolate from others during this season right now unless you fight against it. The third temptation that I think we're facing is a temptation to forget God's presence in our lives. Here's what I mean. If I expect my faith to simply happen on its own, without any discipline, without any effort or intentionality on my part, I will see my faith diminish. Because that which we neglect, we forget. We grow unaware of God's presence in time because we're not making ourselves available to His presence. We're not aligning our lives in such a way where we hear from God and hear about God, and in time we forget that He's even there. I think it's easy for us to experience that right now in this season, thinking that spirituality will just happen. We, we don't succeed spiritually then, or we don't have the spiritual victories that God intends for us. So it's easy to forget God's presence right now unless you fight against it. And by the way, you likely do not approach anything else in life like that with that kind of apathy or lack of attention. You have that kind of apathy toward work, you just watch how unsuccessful you'll be in your career. You have that kind of apathy toward your health and fitness, you watch how unhealthy you will become. If you're a parent and you approach parenting with that kind of apathy and lack of attention, you just watch how that will in time hurt your children. Anything that is worthwhile is worth fighting for. And that is certainly true of our faith. So for the time remaining, I want us to look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, and these famous words of the Apostle Paul. Paul is writing from prison. This is his second imprisonment in Rome. It's different from his first imprisonment that is recorded in Acts chapter 28. There he was under house arrest, but now as he is writing to Timothy here, he is at the famous Mamertime prison in Rome. This is a harsh, dark dungeon, and he is chained in suffering. These are the last known words of the Apostle Paul because shortly after he finishes this letter to Timothy, it is believed that he is executed there in Rome for his faith and for preaching the gospel. So these are very important words. Let's look at what he says in verse 6, starting in verse 6 of 2 Timothy 4. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing or who have longed for his appearing. So verse 6 is Paul's premonition that his time on earth is short. He had been devoted to preach the gospel as an apostle, uh, an apostle of Christ through much suffering. For 30 years he had preached the gospel up to this point. He's reflecting back upon his life in Christ. And he, he makes this amazing three-part statement beginning in verse 7 where he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So this statement provides for us today the substance for our discussion in order to understand what fighting for our faith truly means. Fighting for our faith, first of all, means that we've been appointed to engage in a worthy battle. Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I want you to know that this battle for faith is not optional. 
If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're going to have authentic faith in Jesus, there will accompany a lifelong struggle to see that faith come about. Why? Why does it have to be this way? Well, because we all know that that which is simply handed to us does little for us inherent in the Christian life is a struggle that stretches us and grows our character and causes us to depend upon Christ that gives a witness to an unbelieving world as well. All these things God uses in our fight for our faith. But I want you to know it's not only a battle because there are many battles to fight. But Paul talks about the fact that this is a battle worth fighting. He says, this is the good fight. I fought the good fight. This past weekend, my family watched again the movie Creed. It's the first sequel after all the series of Rocky movies that took place. And there's this one scene where Adonis Creed is trying to get Rocky to train him. And they're walking through a gym and Rocky points to some other men in the gym and he says, look at these guys. These guys were raised on the street. They have something to fight for. What are you fighting for? Now what he was asking is this, what is it that is within you that is worth the struggle, worth the work, worth the effort, worth the fight? Because what you fight for matters. The reason to fight must be a worthy one. Why is that true? Because there's always a correlation between the cause and the courage. The greater the cause, the greater the courage. Now, as I'm talking about a fight and a battle, I'm not talking about a human enemy. Although at times you may face adversaries and you may need to endure them in some way. I'm not talking about a physical struggle. Although at times your body may grow weary from intense spiritual focus and from service in the kingdom. What I'm talking about is a battle of the soul that includes the devil himself, but primarily is a battle of choices. Will I choose to continue to follow Christ no matter what, wherever he leads me, or will I get distracted and detoured? So in the Christian life, the only way that we lose the fight for our faith is to quit is to throw in the towel, is to stop fighting. Because if we endure and keep fighting, we will win. The Apostle Paul is saying here, I stayed in the ring. Could that be said about you? The second thing that I think fighting for our faith means is that true faith is achieved over a process of time through endurance. Paul says, I have finished the race. Now notice, he says the race, not a race or not any race. The ideal here is that this was a race that was chosen for the Apostle Paul to run and he stayed in it. He didn't quit. He ran it to the finish line. He didn't give up. Now, quitting today comes in different forms. There's outright overt quitting and stopping where we consciously and quite intentionally say, I quit, I give up. But often quitting is not like that. Quitting is much more subtle. It's a drift. It's a result of neglect. It's a focus on other less important things that consume us, that preoccupies our minds and thereby engages us in a race, an entirely different race than the one that we were supposed to run in the first place. It's not that we quit fighting. It's that we quit fighting for the right things. It's not that we quit running is that we begin to run for the wrong thing. So the real fear here is not that we fail, but that instead we succeed at the wrong things because this deceives us. We fight fights that are unworthy. We run races that don't matter and often we don't realize it until the end of the fight or at the end of the race and we say, my, why did I give such energy and focus and time to this someone or something that in the end did not matter? Paul says that he has run and finished a race. Now, Paul is referring, of course, to a marathon, which by this time had become very popular in the Greek culture. You may know the legend of the marathon. The legend says that there was a Greek runner, a Greek messenger who ran from Marathon in Greece all the way to Athens, which is about 25 miles away. 
He ran and arrived at Athens to announce the news that they had had a victory over the Persian army. I think this occurred in 490 BC. And legend tells us that once he announced the message of victory, he collapsed and died, which tells you something about running a marathon, right? But Paul is referring to this race that is run. Now, I know three things are true about a marathon. First of all, they're long, 26.2 miles. Secondly, they're difficult. You've heard of hitting the wall. If you're a runner, you've hit the wall. That psychological barrier where your mind is shouting to your body, stop, what are you doing, you idiot? They're long, they're difficult, but they are worth it as well. Those who have succeeded in running a marathon says it was worth it, that the reward was worth the agony and the struggle. So Paul is saying, I was chosen for a race and I stayed in it to the very end. Now this is a fulfillment of his lifelong mission. In fact, 10 years earlier in his first imprisonment in Rome, a decade earlier, he said these words as recorded in Philippians chapter 3, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching toward what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And he is now reflecting back upon his life and he's saying, I stayed in that race. So could that be said about you? And here's the third thing I think that fighting for our faith means. Fighting for our faith means understanding that our faith is a treasure worth protecting and keeping. Paul says, I have kept the faith. And of all the things that Paul could have clung to, all the things that he could have held on to, all the things that he could have kept, it was the faith that mattered most to him. The one thing that he kept with him and refused to lose was to let go of his faith. He defended it, he protected it, he treasured it, he shared it. Now when I read this, I'm reminded of those amazing words of Jesus. In, in the gospel where he talks about the kingdom of God. He's teaching about the kingdom of God and he says that the kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field that a man comes upon it and finds this treasure. And with joy, the Bible says, with joy, he goes and he sells all that he has and he returns and he buys the field because buying the field that contained the treasure was worth everything that he had. Jesus goes on to say that the kingdom of God is like a merchant sailing in a ship that is searching for pearls, beautiful pearls, and he comes upon a pearl and he returns back and he goes and he buys this pearl because it is worth everything that he has. And so the kingdom of God is of great value. And I want to remind you that your faith is of immense value. That's our faith. It's worth all. It outweighs all. It's supreme to all. It is a possession to keep and not to lose, to hold on to despite all things, things which seek to tear it away from us, to guard it, to protect it, to defend it. It's worth fighting for. It's worth running for. It's worth holding on to with all my might. Now we know this to be true, but the current of life causes us to forget that. You say, well, Mike, why is our faith of such great value? Well, there are many reasons, but one primary reason is because of what it yields for us in the end. And this is what Paul talks about in verse eight. Read it with me. He says, now there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So when we were in Wyoming on our trip, we went shopping for souvenirs. That's what you do on vacation, right? You shop for souvenirs because you're going to take those back home. And so we bought a couple of t-shirts, a couple of caps. We bought some coffee beans from a coffee shop that we loved while we were there. We brought all those things back with us to our home. But listen, when we go to our eternal home, there is no souvenirs that we will take with us. It all stays here. The reward is waiting on the other side. There's a crown waiting for us, something of much greater value. So why do we become so obsessed with that in the end, which will not last into eternity. 
Here's what is true. Please get this. Without the fighting, without the running, without the keeping, we miss the crowning. It's because of fighting the good fight, finishing the race, and keeping the faith that the reward becomes ours. Now, I don't know if it's going to be a literal crown that will be placed upon our heads. It could certainly be or some other kind of honor that will be ours. But I know this, there will be some kind of euphoric gladness where we will say to ourselves that this fight for our faith was worth it. It was more than worth it. That's what Paul is describing here. But it could be, it could be that we don't really believe that there's something awaiting those who endure in faith. We say, well, that's a nice thought, you know, a crown in heaven. It's kind of a cool thought, pretty little notion. But come on, Mike, a crown of righteousness that will be given to us. Sadly, that's the way many approach this thing of eternal rewards. They look at it symbolically. They look at it in some way where it's just kind of a nice notion. And the reason I know this is true is because if we believe with all of our hearts that there is coming a day that is better than this day, a day that far outweighs any burden, any suffering, or any inconvenience that I face right now that may accompany my struggle for faith right now, if we believe that, then we would say, as the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 8, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed to us. We would say that, we would believe it, and we would live like it. If we really believed in that which awaits us, we wouldn't quit, we wouldn't drift, we wouldn't yawn at spiritual things, we wouldn't ignore God. We wouldn't find things more appealing than our relationship to Christ, not if we knew the great value of the reward for which we are fighting. We would give attention and energy and focus to our spiritual growth. And rather than just drifting and thinking it would happen on its own without any decisive action or any intentionality, instead we would take seriously following Christ if we truly understood what waits for us on the other side. We would say that the energy, the effort, the fight, the race, the struggle, it's worth it. It's more than worth it. And anyone or anything that seeks to appeal to my passions more than my love for Christ is not worthy, not by a long shot. If we lived in the reality of the life after this one, we would live this life differently now. We would fight the good fight. We would finish the race. We would keep the faith. And our love for Jesus would come first. So here's my concern for us, brothers and sisters. Are we growing passive in our faith? Are we succumbing to temptations, to apathy and isolation, to arranging life in a way where we forget about God's presence? Today I'm asking you to take action decisive, intentional action to give focus and energy and attention to the things of God, to swim against the current of this online world where you fade into the background, where you remove yourself from people and accountability, where you get lost in cyberspace and thereby succumb to temptation and darkness, where you skip and neglect what you know is important for your faith. It's not easy to resist. I know that, I understand that, but that's why it's called a fight. And that's why Paul would say, I fought the good fight, I've run the race, I've kept the faith. There is now in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord will give to me on that day. But he says it's not only for him, listen, he's talking about us, it's for us as well. If we endure, if we will not stop, if we will not give up. Now I'm asking you to take your best next step in your faith. Maybe that means to begin your day with prayer in Bible reading to incorporate this into your life or rededicate, recommit yourself to it once again. Maybe it means for you to forgive someone or for you to ask for someone to forgive you. Maybe it means for you to have a conversation with someone that you've been putting off. Is that your best next step of faith? Maybe it means to be a witness 
at your workplace. Maybe it means to trust God financially. Maybe it means to connect to a community group in our church where you can grow with other people and get to know them and build friendships that will help you spiritually to get up next to other believers who will pray for you and encourage you in your following Christ, that you would serve possibly in your church, that you'd get outside of yourself and give yourself for the sake of others. Now, I don't know what it is, but I know two things are true for our best next step. First of all, I know that everybody listening has a best next step. The second thing that I know is true is that if that step is to be taken, it will not be taken accidentally. It will be taken with attention and a decision that you will make, intentionality and courage to step out and to do something that will make a difference in your life spiritually. So will you fight for your faith? Will you run the race? Will you keep your faith and not lose it? Especially during this difficult season that we're walking through. So I wanna ask you to bow your heads right now, wherever you are, bow your heads, close your eyes, and I want to ask you a question. When you come to the end of your life, will you be able to look back as the Apostle Paul did and say, I was involved in the fight for my faith in Christ. I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. I have run the race. And it was worth it. Will you be able to look back upon your life and say that? Will you be able to say, as the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter three, where he said, I forget what lies behind. One thing I do, I forget what lies behind. Listen, there are things in your past that are keeping you from your future. There are patterns that you've set in your life that you think that's just the way life is. And I'm here to tell you that you can start again right now. You can rededicate yourself and recommit yourself to the things of God. Start over. This is a time for starting over. There's forgiveness, there's cleansing, there is renewal, there is restoration in Christ Jesus. He awaits to bring this to you if you will only step out in faith and take your best next step. So if that's you today, I wanna to pray for you in just a moment. But I also wanna to talk to another group of people, again, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, another group of people who might be listening today, who for them, for you, your next best step is your first step in following Jesus. You see, you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior. You've never entered into a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Well, I wanna say to you today that God loves you, that He sent His Son to die on the cross for your sin, and that God is knocking on the door of your heart right now, asking to come into your life, offering you a relationship with Him, one of purpose, one of great, great value, one that will make a a difference in your life and transform your life in such a wonderful, wonderful way, a cleansing and a renewal and a forgiveness for your sin. And then you will walk in relationship with Jesus for the rest of your life. This is what he offers you today. If you've never begun your personal relationship with Jesus, I want to encourage you to make this most important decision today. And I would like to lead you in that decision right now. So if that's you, your heads are bowed. I want to ask you to pray a prayer with me, a prayer that reflects the attitude of your heart and just giving yourself to God right now and trusting Jesus as your Savior. So if that's you, pray this prayer with me in your heart of hearts to God. Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your Son to die on the cross for my sin. I have sinned. I have done that which is wrong. Please forgive me. Please come into my life. I believe in who Jesus was, and now I trust in what He did when He died on the cross for my sin and took my place. Forgive me, cleanse me. Help me to enter now into a relationship with You, and help me to understand from this point on Your plan and purpose for my, my life. I want to live for You and with You. And one day when I die, Take me to heaven to be with you forever and ever. I trust you now for my salvation. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Now, with your head still bowed, if you prayed that prayer, the Bible says that you've become a new creation, that the Spirit of Christ now dwells in you. You've begun your personal relationship with God through His Son, Jesus. You're a Christian, and you need to walk and grow in that faith. Let us know. Let somebody know that you made this decision today. Someone that would encourage you and pray for you. Be happy to hear this news. Let us know. We'd be honored to mail you some information on how you can grow in your Christian life from this point on. Now, for all uh, others who whose heads are bowed, I want to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ, those who are believers right now. And I want to pray for those of you who have grown weary in the race. Pray that God will give you uh, a spirit of endurance to continue on. For those of you who have maybe stopped running the race of faith and fighting the, the fight of faith, I want to pray that you will begin again to recommit, re-up to the fight for faith. But then also want to just celebrate those of you who are running this race, who are fighting the good fight, who are keeping the faith. You've been doing that and it hasn't been easy. And I think God smiles upon you and I want to pray for you and celebrate you as well and that God would continue to give you strength. So Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the amazing way that it transforms our lives through the power of your spirit. I want to pray for these dear brothers and sisters that we would all continue to run the race and fight the fight and keep the faith. I pray, God, that you would give us strength, that we would depend upon you when we grow weary, that we would find strength in you, God, beyond our own strength, and that we could continue to fight for the things that matter most in life and not forget, not neglect, not overlook what is truly important. So bring us back, Father. Strengthen us. Give us that spirit of endurance and perseverance. And we will trust you for it. And we look forward to that day, Father. That day that will come for each and every one who fights the fight, who runs the race, who keeps the faith, where you will bestow upon us the crown of righteousness. What a day that will be. And it will all be worth it. Remind us of that. That it will all be worth it in the end. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, we're going to conclude our worship service with some singing right now, and I want you to continue to reflect and respond to God as you do. Let this song minister to you. If you have a prayer request, please let us know about your prayer request. You can click the link and submit a prayer request. We have a team of people who would pray over these requests. If you are one who trusted Jesus as your Savior, let us know that. Contact us. Click the link. Let us know about your decision today. We'd be honored to know about it, to pray for you, and to possibly send you some information to help you grow as now a believer in Jesus. If you're one who would like to give to the Brook right now in support of our ministry, you can click the link and do that. And then finally, if you're a visitor, please let us know that you watch today and we would love to send you some information about the Brook Church. So let's worship now as we sing. with 
of mercy Now your mercy will be my song God bless you all. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope that you have a great weekend. Uh, I want to remind you to stay connected to the Brook Church, particularly during this difficult season that we're walking through. Be sure to get the church app. Be sure to give us your email so that we can keep you updated about all that's going on and when our possible return will take place. I want to say to you that next week I'm going to begin a new message series called This Is Us. This Is Us. And the caption to that series is People Like Us Do Things Like This. So we're going to talk about the church and we're going to talk about the brook and we're talking about our vision, our vision and our mission and our values. And we're going to talk about all that God has called us to be and to do. So if you're a seasoned veteran to the brook, if you're a church attender or a member, this is going to be a great reminder to you of what we're all about. And I think it's going to be really encouraging to you. It's a different kind of series. But then also, if you're a visitor and you're a guest, this is a great way for you to understand what our church is all about. And I hope that you'll join us for the weeks to come. God bless you all. Thank you again for joining us today. <music>